You're listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, a production company specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, festivals we're attending, and how to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk. And now, enjoy Factual America with our host, Matthew Sherwood. Welcome to Factual America, the podcast that explores America through the lens of documentary filmmaking. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and I will be interviewing documentary filmmakers, their subjects, and subject matter experts in politics, history, culture, just to name three. Uh, And today we have uh, Naz Tavakali Farr, did I get that uh, right? Yeah, great. Uh, Who uh, certainly uh, falls in that, uh, that latter category. She's an award-winning science and tech business uh, journalist and broadcaster, uh, currently with the BBC Current Affairs Radio. She's a radio documentarian herself, and she also hosts the podcast uh, The Gender Knot, uh, about how men and women can do a better job of getting along. So without further ado, I uh, welcome Naz to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure having you. Naz has chosen The Inventor, Out for Blood in Silicon Valley, which came out in 2019, as the film that's going to serve as the backdrop to today's discussion. Um, It's a film by Alex Gibney, who is a a leading light uh, uh, in documentary filmmaking uh, and has made such films as uh, Enron's Smartest Guys in the Room, Scientology, Going Clear, among others. Uh, so, uh, Naz, without further ado, uh, why don't you tell us why you chose this film? Um, so, this film brings together several of my obsessions, in okay. a sense. So, I've been a business and tech reporter, and I do this podcast, The Gender, not a lot about men and women mm. getting on. So, I think so many of the important themes from these different scenes come together in this film. So, mm. Theranos, they were a blood testing company. I think they mm. ran for about 11 or 12 years until they were kind of... Uh, shown to be a complete fraud. And the founder was Elizabeth Holmes, and she was the first self-made female billionaire. So um, out in Silicon Valley, where it's full of male founders, and, Mm -hmm. you know, the the scene doesn't have a very good reputation when it comes to gender diversity. You have this woman who has this massive vision about completely disrupting healthcare. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's just so many many big themes that not only am I interested Mm -hmm. in, but that are really big in society today, like, yeah. you know, um, yeah, disrupting things, women rising, how do women mm-hmm. try and get on in, you know, a boys club? It, it all really comes together, and it's just such an incredibly compelling story and a really cautionary tale as well. This is Alex Gibney, I would say, at his finest. Um, but for those who haven't had a chance to see the film, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the, the story is or haven't been following the Theranos story for the last uh, five years or so. So Theranos was this blood testing company yeah. in Silicon Valley. And the concept was that you could get all these sort of blood tests done through one pinprick of blood. Mm-hmm. And Elizabeth Holmes, is she's the founder. Her vision was that every house could have a small box, kind of the size of like a, you know like an old school computer or something in your house and you could do, you know, take a finger prick of blood, put the sample into this box and then get all these results, um, you know, just there and there. Mm. Um, So it was was to kind of revolutionize blood testing. Mm. um, And the company, I think they existed for 11 or 12 years before, you know, uh, they were exposed. What is fascinating is that, so so back in, I think it was 2016, the Wall Street Journal did a big investigation where... Mm. The entire thing was a sham and not meaning that it didn't work very well or there were problems in that there was no device, like there was (laughs) nothing. And that is the crazy thing about it because you you often hear about frauds or about companies doing badly and it's like maybe they've overestimated something Mm. or there are big problems and it's legit that people Mm. report on that. But what was just so mind-blowing was that there was nothing. This box just didn't work at all. Mm. Um, There was literally nothing, and that's just mind-blowing. And also the other famous thing about Theranos is that Elizabeth Holmes was the first self-made female billionaire. Mm. So, um, you know, 
And and also because Silicon Valley, it's all like, you know, it's a bit of a boys club. Yep. And so it, it is quite fascinating that not only was she a woman, but I thought it was very clever that she aligned herself with the medical side of things. Yeah. Because often we think like women, medicine, there's a really good tie-in. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just think it was like... Whether she did that on purpose or not, it was just perfectly done. But just, yeah, blowing the lid on on the fact that there was absolutely nothing there. Yeah. Well, I guess you, you, you've, you've actually raised the question that I wanted to raise, which was, I mean, let's look at Elizabeth Holmes. Um, is this fraud from the beginning? Did she, is she, was she a true believer? I mean, I think that's what the film really mm. kind of lets us come to that conclusion, doesn't it? Uh, not to, I would keep wanting to say spoiler alert when I'm discussing this film, because <laughs> even though it's a documentary and we already know the results, although still going to trial, um, it has that feel to it. It's like a thriller. Or something. It is a thriller. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got everything. It's got Greek tragedy. You've mm -hmm. even got uh, the, the professor who's like the Greek chorus on the side coming in every now and then and giving us some, uh, you know, Taking, bringing us back to reality. Mm -hmm. But what is your view on uh, Elizabeth Holmes? Um, you know, did she, was she thinking, was this a fraud from the beginning? I don't think it was. Um, no. I feel a bit torn saying this. I, so aside from the movie, I've read a lot about Theranos. I've watched, I've listened to podcasts about the company. Mm. Um, I get the feeling that, no, she was just kind of overly confident and overly ambitious and it got out of hand. Yeah. That was I. I didn't get the feeling like she was going for a fraud from the start, mm -hmm. and I think maybe the culture of Silicon Valley, which is all like you know, yeah. fake it till you make it, right. think big, um, move you, fast and break things. Move, exactly. I think these things are just kind of yeah. added to that. Yeah. There, there was a part where um, in the, one of the laboratory scientists, yeah. he said he said that um, if you raised concerns about how things were going, you'd be told oh, you're just not a Silicon Valley yeah. person, which I thought was quite interesting because it was this thing of like, no, you should kind of always be pushing instead yeah. of being skeptical. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I, I I, don't think it was a con from the start. So do you think it's an indictment of Silicon Valley? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you, I mean, do we think Silicon Valley is full of Theranos yeah. companies? Yeah. And actually, uh, I think personally another reason I like the story a lot mm -hmm. is because... Um, being being a reporter in that sort of scene, even though I'm in London, so yeah. it's not as overblown. Um, I think the journalists always we feel like the sort of mean, skeptical ones who are mm. always sort of questioning yeah. these things. So I think I've really related to the Wall Street Journal's reporter yeah. as well, who was kind of asking questions. Um, I think there is, I think a, a lot of that scene there is very much a culture of questions mm. are not really good like it's not great to ask questions you're kind of um trying to hinder yeah. progress you yeah. know you're meant to be positive about everything all the time yeah um and hence why you know if scientists had concerns they'd be told oh well you're just not a silicon valley person yeah so i, I do think it is an indictment of uh, like there, there was another part where one of the laboratory scientists was talking about the box where these tests were meant to happen. And he was trying to tell Elizabeth that can we make it a little bit bigger because um, there are certain laws of thermodynamics which mean that this size will constrain what we can do. Yeah. And it was this thing of no, and he kept saying that you can't argue with the laws of physics. So I, th I think, yeah, it is an indictment of... And he didn't say it, but basically the rejoinder to that is uh, they were saying, yes, you can. Cause exactly. Because it's, it's Silicon Valley. Exactly. And you have to have a vision... Yeah, and if you don't, I mean, as 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 uh, Dan, um, how you say his surname, Ariely? Yeah, yeah, uh, said there's this fine line between being a visionary and then having a foot in reality. Yeah, and I think that's something he has has studied yeah. uh, quite a bit as a behavioral like, economist. Yeah, um, but um, well, that's I mean, I think. Uh, you you raise a, you raise a you know further interesting points. I mean, I think someone else was talking about the difference between the tiled part of the company and the carpeted part. And you had all these scientists who were laboring under some sometimes extreme conditions and just seeing no this this wasn't going to work. And yet everyone, the Silicon Valley types, all just you know jumping around and uh, saying this is you know you're 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 not with the program mm -hmm. you know basically. So you say it is an indictment of Silicon Valley. Is it an indictment of journalism too? Because you were kind of highlighting this. Uh, we have and we have a, a whole host of characters uh, in this this film, yeah. which are just and we have uh, we have uh, Dan Arieleta, the uh, journalist from the Ken. U Ken. Sorry, 
Ken from um, from the New Yorker. We have Roger Parloff from Fortune, who um, seem like uh, well, Roger especially, very sincere individual. Uh, but maybe you could say a little bit more about about that, especially yeah. given your background as a as a journalist. Yeah. So Ken Auletta did a big profile of her for the New Yorker, yeah. and Roger Parloff did a profile of her for Fortune magazine, and she was on the cover. Um, I th- I think the title was This CEO is Out for Blood, or maybe that was one of the other covers she was mm. on. Um, and then there's John Carey Root of the Wall Street Journal who actually mm. broke the story. Um, and John I'm a massive fan of because yeah. he's just the exact right type of character. He's just a very deadpan New Yorker who, yeah. uh, you know, just sees through nonsense. Mm. Um, so I think he was. it was fascinating just watching the personalities. Um, so Ken Auletta, who'd written about her for The New Yorker, um, he still seemed quite, um, I mean, he seemed quite upbeat in general. And I raised that because Roger Parloff seemed really embarrassed and mm. felt almost responsible for having put her on the cover. Yeah. And so seeing the contrast between these two people was also very interesting for me because, yeah, Roger Parloff felt like, responsible for having helped this company grow. And, you know, they're doing serious stuff about patients' health. Mm. Whereas Ken Auletta seemed to just not really care. He was like, oh, yeah, well, she lied to me. Um, So, yeah, it did make me think a little bit about, um, well, I don't want to make personal indictments about any of these reporters, but kind of like, why are you a reporter? Because, um, yeah, I would feel some sense of responsibility if I had Mm. gotten it that wrong. Let's listen to this uh, great uh, clip with John Kerry Roo. Um, I mean... Say something about that. I mean, what what was it that he saw, and why wasn't he? Why wasn't the wool pulled over his eyes where it was for these others? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm wondering if it's because he was based in New York, so away yeah. from a lot of the hype that yeah. that is talked about all the time. Um, also, he's an investigative reporter. Um, he's done reporting about medicine and yeah. about science. I think he'd won a Pulitzer for a previous medical he investigation. Had. Yeah, yeah. So he seemed like the kind of guy who kind of was. In the know, and I just love the fact that it was only one quote mm. that made him think this is nonsense. Yeah. So you know, just this one quote, and he's like, "No, no, no, wait, wait a minute." Also, I've also wondered, um, just because I think about cultural things a lot, he's half French he as is. well. Yes. So I wonder if there's a bit of that sort of European skepticism to these things that crept in. Possibly. I mean, he did, and then uh, after studying U.S., he his early journalistic days were all in all in. Um, away from the U.S., yeah. and then he came back to the Wall Street Journal. So, yeah, he yeah. comes across as the uh, uh, the rational adult. There's not too many of them in this film, but yeah. he and the, um, uh, is it Phyllis? Uh, Gardner. Ph- Gardner, the, uh, the uh, professor at Stanford, are like the two adults in the room yeah. when this is yeah. all going on. I mean, the other thing you put, we, we, we've discussed a lot about, okay, this didn't work, so it's a fraud. Um, they've attracted, we know that over, what, $900 million uh, in investment, uh, people who've invested in leading Silicon Valley firms were mm-hmm. were investors, um, but the the real you know this what we haven't even mentioned yet is that you know people's lives were in danger. Yeah, I mean maybe you can say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, it's just it's, I can see why Roger was uh, apoplectic because yeah. you yeah. know um, you know having to call up getting lab tests and discovering that they were wrong and having to call people up and tell them to rush to the hospital. Um, so not not to give a spoiler, but um, Theranos had made deals with Walgreens and CVS mm-hmm. where there would be sort of Theranos wellness centers in the stores. So you could go there and get the blood test done there. Yeah. And what was happening was that they were taking vials of blood instead of a small, small finger mm-hmm. prick um, and sending these back to the lab in... California, Mm -hmm. and then running them on normal commercial analyzers. Um, But also they were doing sort of strange things like taking finger prick tests, but then they'd have to dilute them so that they could put these in these commercial analyzers, which is not how the machines are meant to run. So people were coming back with crazy results um, and results that were off the charts, Mm. um, which is kind of crazy. So, you know, it's like you might not, you might not go to the doctor about something serious or you might freak out. Because, you know, you've got some crazy results coming back. So, um, yeah, people's lives were at risk. And I think, I'm, I'm not sure if it came up in this documentary or not, I think one person died as a result of Theranos' uh, tests. I don't think that's in the documentary, but yeah. uh, there's been so much written about this. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, and what, 
I mean, in my opinion, I'd like to hear what you have to think. I think this all gets, we love storytelling here at uh, Factual America and Alamo Pictures. Uh, this all gets back to the fact that she had a compelling story to yeah. tell, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. there's that one scene where they just, they pay, they, obviously she repeated it so many times, they had like 16, 20 something clips up all at the same time, her telling the story about her, her uncle who passed away and this idea of black. I mean, it's, and we find out it was an industry that was ripe for disruption. And, you know, there were these two companies that were basically monopolizing blood tests. So it was, there was a, there was a good, uh, good reason to be in this business. But um, again, uh, maybe you can say a little more about that in terms of the, uh, the, the story that she had to tell. I mean, the story was amazing because um, she, you know, one of her grandfathers was an entrepreneur. The other was mm -hmm. a great medical pioneer. Um, she's this young woman. She's just dropped out of Stanford to yeah. go into like the medical field. And the, the, there's a story she tells often about an uncle she used to spend a lot of time with. And then uh, he got a disease that had they have caught it earlier, mm -hmm. maybe he would have survived. And so the whole um, the whole premise of Theranos was um, so that no one has to say goodbye yeah. too soon. Yeah. Um, from stuff I've read elsewhere, apparently she'd only met that uncle twice or that entire story was I did fabricated wonder. as well. I did wonder, which is, which is interesting because with this, getting back to the documentary itself, um, there's a limit to what you can put into an hour and a half, two hours of a film and to tell a story and get compelling cinema out of it. But... Do you feel like maybe there was even some, I mean, Alex Gibney had to leave certain things out um, because, yeah, you. I think he tried to give that feeling across, mm -hmm. but he didn't explicitly say that she'd only met that uncle. Yeah, uh, I, I actually liked the way he, he made it because I think every medium is good for conveying different parts of a story. Yeah. Um, I think with, with not just Theranos, but Silicon Valley in general, the the story of the founder is such a big deal. Mm. So you know, it's it's almost like founders are like rock stars, yeah. and their personal story is so important. And it's especially interesting talking about this now because we've just had the the situation happen with WeWork, yeah. who also had a yeah. very compelling, charismatic founder, mm. and they've completely been called out for being full of crap as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, but but I think that's why this documentary worked so well because a lot of it was focused on her. And also, I mean, she was kind of creepy. Like, you know, she she is kind of sociopathic. She blatantly lies. She doesn't blink. Mm. She's just she's weird. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and at the, I don't know. I just I just find it visually quite a fascinating story mm. as well because I think like she just had the right look as well. She mm -hmm. used to wear all black, black turtlenecks, yeah. like yeah. like Steve, Steve Jobs. Yeah. Um, Visually, I found her fascinating because she she was very beautiful, but not too beautiful, which mm -hmm. I think was just perfect. Yeah, like she was very classic looking, yeah. but also kind of not very sexual. And I just mm -hmm. I just think it worked perfectly in the paradigm of like a female medical inventor. So I th I think what I liked about the movie is just the focus on the visuals. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of really famous images of her in like you know her black turtleneck, mm -hmm. her her blonde hair in a in a slightly messy bun. Yeah. So she looks elegant, but you know not too polished. And she's holding up these tiny uh, these tiny test tubes of blood. So yeah. they're sort of tiny. You can hold them in between your fingers, and it's just such compelling imagery, and it just looks fantastic. And speaking of compelling uh, imagery, I mean they even bring Errol Morris in. Yes. Yes. To make the some of some of the adverts, yeah. yeah, and so you know she's standing in front of a white backdrop, and um, she's talking about yeah, no one no one needs to say goodbye too soon, and yeah. she doesn't blink. She's got these <laughs> enormous blue eyes, and she doesn't blink, and it's creepy. And I think yeah. that's what Alex Gibney did so well because visually, it's it's weird because. I, I remember seeing Elizabeth Holmes around. I wasn't hugely into the story before yeah. they went down, but you know, it was like, you know, this elegant, smart woman, like the visuals are good, but the way he had put the visuals together with all this creepy music, yeah. um, it just worked really well. Yeah. It was like, wow. Yeah. And and maybe this is less of a visual thing, but um the the other two characters who really stood out for me were two of the young lab yes. technicians yeah. um who both whistle blew. Mm -hmm. Um so one of them was a young woman Erica Chung. Yeah. Um the other was Tyler Schultz who Correct. was grandfather of George Schultz. Grandson, yeah. Yeah. Uh, grandson of yeah. George Schultz who former secretary of state who was on the board. Yeah. Um and Theranos's board this is another thing it was yeah. all like former diplomats and statesmen and no medical people were on the board. That's right. Um and I I 
I've I've really admired these two because they were the two youngest people at the company, and they kept making like they, they kept trying to mm-hmm. talk to people about it. They kept um, trying to speak to George Shultz. Yeah. They both went to regulators. They both mm-hmm. spoke to the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. And w- watching that movie was interesting for me because there were so many people who talked about the problems with Theranos, and it looked like none of them really did anything. Yeah. And these two, who were the youngest people at the company, did. Um, and that really that really stood out for me. Because yeah. I'm, I'm not impressed with other people who were like, oh, there were all these problems, but they didn't bother to yeah. try and do anything. Yeah. And I think visually the contrast between... Because I think um, they were only a few years younger than Elizabeth, so she's yeah. this like very sort of elegant, well-put-together person. And they're just these two... Um, Really scruffy young twenty year olds, but I, mm. I mean that in a nice way. There exactly. was a realness to them, yeah. you know. So. Hoping my children turn into those yes. two, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um and they actually bothered to like keep pressing, keep pushing, and they were being like followed, they were being yeah. sued, they you know, they were in serious trouble. But um yeah, that was very striking for me. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases and upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. And now, back to Factual America. Uh, Welcome back to Factual America, where we've been discussing the film The Inventor, Out for Blood in Silicon Valley by Alex Gibney, the... uh, Oscar-winning director who uh, Esquire called the probably the most important documentary filmmaker of his time. Um, you may this film uh, came, came only came out this year, uh, premiered at Sundance in uh, January 2019, released in March. Uh, but um, you'll know Alex Gibney from uh, Enron, Smartest Guys in the Room, Scientology, Going Clear, and he's probably still got bodyguards because of that, uh, and uh, some other. Um, other other f- films that are sort of now part of the canon. Um, with that in mind, and given the discussion we've had, we've discussed a lot about the the, the sort of the plot, you w- if you will. Um, now, as it might be good to talk about uh, the the filmmaking side of this, and um, uh, Alex has gotten some criticism for maybe uh, not being uh, not you know not not. Bake, baking a judgment, basically, on 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 uh, Elizabeth Holmes and and her uh, and her partners. Mm. You know that didn't stand out to me. Yeah, I, I maybe it's because it's in a way it's so self explanatory. Mm. Um, just the fact that what they did was so harmful and it was such a massive fraud. Yeah. I don't feel like it it needed much of a sort of editorial line on top. It, it it's. The story itself is so heavy hitting that yeah. he doesn't need to hit us over the head with his own polemics, if yeah. if if you will, I guess. Yeah, is but, what you would say. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, though, um, so I've I've referenced the fact that there's a lot of creepy sounding music, mm. a lot of um, old school footage of inventions gone wrong. Mm. I feel that stuff kind of did editorialize it a little yeah. bit because it it made it um, kind of the whole story went into the realm of delusion. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the imagery he'd use of Elizabeth, um, you know, even the way a lot of the images of her were used, so it would be like really zoning on her eyes or mm. zoning on certain very grandiose poses mm-hmm. she was in. Mm-hmm. I think that all re- in some ways did editorialize it, that yeah. this is a delusional person. Um, yeah. And he... And he, he- let the actors speak for themselves. Uh, we were talking about, is this an indictment of Silicon Valley? I mean, he talked to the first investors who you could say were the sort of uh, uh, the ones who really got this all going because if they didn't put money in at the beginning, she wouldn't have been in, put in touch with all these other people. But I don't you know? think um, I don't think that part of the story was bad at all though because like any, um, any company or any idea you have, mm-hmm. you're going to take a risk. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I, I don't think that was necessarily a bad thing, you know, like she's got a big idea. Mm-hmm. So many things we use every day came from someone having a crazy yeah. idea. So I think that part of it was okay. It was more the fact that once it things weren't working, they weren't changing tack. Mm-hmm. So again, once her laboratory scientist was like, this box needs to be bigger, yeah. it doesn't work with the laws of yeah. physics, they weren't listening. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think I think the indictment was, I feel it was more about just like delusion and not wanting to listen and wanting to do the impossible, even when it's 
not possible. There's an early mm. scene where she talks to Phyllis Gardner, yeah. um, where they talk to Phyllis Gardner, who is the Stanford professor, and um, I think she's um, she's got a lot of patents um, in in medicine yeah. as well, and a lot of students would go to her with you know, their business ideas. And she was talking about when Elizabeth had come to see her, um, it was it was something like a patch. She had an idea for a patch which would um, administer antibiotics or something like that. And Phyllis mm -hmm. was saying, this is actually impossible. It yeah. doesn't fit with biology and biochemistry. And physics and... Exactly. And yeah. So I, I think those were the bits that really stood out, just letting these actual scientists be like, yeah. this doesn't fit with the laws of science. Yeah, um, yeah more, more than the fact that like, you know, she had a big idea and some people put some money into it early on. Yeah. yeah. But then she goes to the head of science, not to get back into the plot again, but she goes to the head of science at Stanford Yeah. who's like, oh yeah, I see the next Steve Jobs. Yeah. And, and just to be, as you've already alluded to, it's all these sort of men who are about the age of her, who would be the age of her grandfather yeah. who buy into her. Yeah. And it's an interesting yeah. sort of subplot to, to all this. I yeah. Mean, what was it about her? I mean, even George Schultz, uh, uh, I forget how many different Republican administrations he's been in. He was former Secretary of State. As his son said, he survived Watergate and Iran-Contra with his reputation unscathed. And he, you know, he buys yeah. into it to the point that he even doesn't really believe his grandson yeah. for a while. Yeah. Um, but I think... Um, but I wonder how much it, it was also wanting a woman to succeed. Because Silicon Valley has a very bad mm. reputation for being a boys' club, and um, yeah. not to be rude, but maybe slightly autistic men who are kind of nerdy maybe. scientists yeah. and don't yeah. really get people. So I think there was this real kind of urge that, like, yeah, a woman she can succeed. Yeah. Um, and again, just uh, I can see why these older men liked her because you know she was very classic, she was very well spoken. I mean, mm. she was very beautiful, but also quite safe in a way. So yeah. I can I can totally see the appeal there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you've you've lived in the United States. You've went to the top uh, journalism school in the United States at Columbia. Uh, so, do you think this is something that would only happen in America? Yes. And yeah. why? Why do you think that? Um, it's a bit like I've heard a lot of people talk about cults and how they never happen in Britain yeah. <laughs> because everyone's well, no everyone's, one believes in anything. In exactly. Britain, yeah. <laughs> everyone's too skeptical yeah, here. Yeah. Um, it's also why I was mentioning that I wonder if. John Kerry being half French had something mm. to do with him, like, smelling this out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely think so. I think um, it's it's not just a Silicon Valley story. I think it is a real American thing of, like, ambition, doing the impossible, mm. um, doing something big, um, change the world. Maybe that's more of a Silicon Valley thing, but I, I think it's a very American concept. Yeah. And, and in some ways, really good as well. Yeah. I'm like, I think of myself as someone who went to the US for grad school, it was because of these ideals of like, yeah. you know, you can do the impossible if you work hard, mm -hmm. you know, you've got like big vision. But I think maybe also vision is the, the, the terms that come to mind with this and with America, I think are ambition and vision. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, no, I think it's totally, that, that would not, I just don't think it would fly here. So do you think that that uh, American society has bought into that so much that 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 even has hindered. I mean, there's a lot of this is there's a lot of layers to this onion, this 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 story, obviously, but that that has even affected the journalism, the investors, maybe even Walgreens, you know, one yeah. of the leading pharmacy, you know, uh, pharmacies in the United States, never even opened up the box that yeah. was doing the test testing and these yeah. sort of things. So this is sort of suspension of disbelief yeah. in wanting to believe that uh, the the big vision then can happen. Yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 interesting because it's also, um, like, I personally think that's also the beauty of America, mm -hmm. that if you've got a big idea, you're not necessarily going to be laughed at. It's more like, well, you know, give it a try. Um, she, she kept quoting, she kept referencing a Thomas Edison quote, right. something about if you fail 10,000 times, that's so that you get it right the 10,000 and first time. Like, yeah. I think these are really beautiful values yeah. but I think it's like if it's in the wrong hands um, they can be very damaging values and I think the other thing that's also like also strikes me as quite an American thing is the focus on the founder mm -hmm. and this um, almost cult of personality so like you know a compelling person I, I feel like again that wouldn't fly here as much well, that goes back to the, even those early investors they made comments of how 
Her great-grandfather was yeah. an entrepreneur. Her great-uncle started a hospital. I mean, this isn't... So surely she's good. Surely, you know. <laughs> I mean, I won't even look at the financials or the business yeah. plan. I mean, I'm not saying they're that glib about it, but yeah. that's they, they're the ones that ra- made yeah. that point. Yeah. Um, but do you think, because you, you said it is an indictment of Silicon Valley or possibly even American capitalism, it, or is it merely just a side effect? You know, this is the kind of the, the ill that you get with all the good because we've all got smartphones in our yeah. pockets and that's come from there. And think about all the many things that are, the, many of the uh, great things that have happened in the last 10 years in terms of tech. Yeah, I think I think maybe a bit of both. Yeah. Um, but, but maybe it is because... Um, Th- this comes up in the movie. I can't yeah. remember who said it, but um, maybe maybe even John Kerry said there's something about um, because a lot of these companies in Silicon Valley were private or are for a long That's time. Right. There's no real need to have to show what's going on to investors. So mm. the the secrecy is is it's, a bit of a problem. It's the rise of the unicorn yes. as compared to the late '90s when p- firms are going public much sooner. They yeah. can stay private for longer, so they can keep the. Even she said they were. I think nearly even at least five years, didn't even have a website, you know, yeah. kept their heads well below the parapet yeah. and uh, before, you know, making this big splash. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But but just going back to her, though, I just, I she is so the personality type that would not fly here. It's like, you know, she's super <laughs> grandiose, like says all these grandiose things, like, you know, like I'm sure... The, the the wall on Theranos when you walked in, it had some quote from Yoda, which is something like, there is no try, you only do or something. Yeah, like, yeah. no, that kind of stuff does not fly here. It's it, not cool. It doesn't fly here. And I, my thought on that one was that run away quickly from any company that has quotes from Star Wars characters <laughs> on their, painted in their reception. But, True, uh, exactly. Yeah. True. But I just, and, and I hate to say this, but just looking at her, like, yeah. you know, she wouldn't blink. She just looked sociopathic. Yeah. And so why did no one spot this? It just, yeah. I don't know. It just seems a bit, um, yeah, it just wouldn't fly here. It, ex- for the exact same reason that cults don't tend to happen in the UK because people are too, um, for good and bad, people yeah. are too skeptical of like big ideas and vision to yeah. like let that fly. Yeah. I don't know. So would that have flown here? That cl- them coming out dancing to MC Hammer's "Don't Touch This" in an ir- on unironic like, way. Yes, yes. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't think it would. And also, they had had one minor test approved yeah. by the Food and Drug Ad- Administration, so it was like making this massive party for like some yeah. minor thing. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it would. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I don't well as as someone who's been over here a while now I can tell you it wouldn't um, I would have have spoken to uh, to groups of uh, co- you know to companies uh, no it would never have flown here um, I I'll, I'll make it a little personal side here if I may uh, when I saw that scene it just kind of a couple things just all came together and there's another side to this story that we've touched on a few times it's the Washington D.C. story. And the last time I saw people dance like that was when I was in an inaugural ball in the 1990s in Washington, D.C. And, you know, it's it, she comes from a, her family's a long time, uh, several generations Washingtonians, well-connected. She felt the need beyond getting the investors in to get all these, you know, from both sides. She had Bill Clinton introducing her at conferences, uh, former secretaries of state and defense from both administrations. Henry Kissinger, for my goodness, my goodness, is is involved. Mm-hmm. You know, John Mattis, uh, who's just left the uh, Trump administration now. So, um, at, anyway, that's a, it's a sort of. And her father was an executive at Enron. Mm-hmm. You just wonder if she couldn't help it that this was she was part of this sort of milieu that just said, "This is the way things are done." Yeah, maybe also. Mm. Well, now this, this is making me think because um, that political establishment is sort of being unseated by the tech establishment. Yeah. So maybe it was a way that they wanted to mm. still stay relevant, maybe. Yeah. I think getting back to sort of what we were talking earlier and uh, about, uh, you know, would that, how would that go over here? I mean, you yourself personally, I mean, what, think back, uh, what, were your, what were your first memories, impressions of the United States? Is when it, I went there. No, before even as a child or even a young young adult, you know, what was, you know, you grew up, uh, the thing that comes up in these interviews when I talk to people, like, you don't, you know, as someone who was born and raised there, they, you don't understand what it was like, you know, for us. 
I mean, we, I think someone once said to me, we all wanted to go to high school in the, in the United States. And you were like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, I don't want everyone to go through that again. But, uh, I mean, what were your, what were your, do you remember? Like, yeah, I think, I think it was that thinking big thing. Yeah. That ambition, thinking big, um, like you can do anything if you put your mind to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is why studying there was interesting. Exactly. Yeah. That was interesting because, um, so I went to journalism school yeah. um, in New York. And um, like, in, you know, in hindsight, you really appreciate something. So, mm. you know, I was at quite a fancy university and um, every week reporters would come in from like the New York Times or whatever and tell us that journalism is dying. Why the hell are any of you here? This is a really bad idea. And it was not what I was expecting from, from America. Yeah. And I'm sure like um, one of my classmates, he was doing like a dual degree at the business school and he was like, right. the rhetoric is totally the opposite. <laughs> so he was always finding like this weird, yeah. Um, yeah. This weird uh, dynamic. dynamic between yeah. the, the two schools on campus just a few meters away. Yeah. Um, so so that, that was a... That was an interesting thing. So, um, yeah, maybe Silicon Valley does kind of feed into a lot of visions of America that we see outside. Because, mm. um, yeah, being at journalism school, then I was kind of more introduced to, like, I guess, like, the lefty strain of America, mm -hmm. maybe the sort of, um, the kind of Bernie Sanders type. Noam Chomsky. Kind yeah, of world. That, yeah, that side. Yeah, yeah. That really, that was very much more prevalent at journalism school. Yeah. Um, and maybe that kind of side travels less outside. Mm. outside the country um because that was new yeah. to me being like oh all these super lefty americans who are very um yeah well you're also in new york city i think so many uh, many of us would tell you but, that, uh, that's true uh, but I, but i that's was the texan in me coming out but yeah, uh, yeah. but i was surprised yeah. though because yeah. like but even new york what like empire state and stuff yeah. Yeah. um yeah yeah, it, it was um so what are your impressions so i've asked you about your impressions before now now that you've lived studied there worked mm -hmm. there now you're, you're back here what are you and now stories like this break what are your what would your what are your impressions now uh fall of capitalism which yeah. is like a big theme that's happening yeah. um i think not i think maybe what's interesting about stories like theranos or what's recently happened with we work and mm -hmm. with uber and other big tech companies where you know there's been a lot of skepticism about them is um yeah that maybe maybe these ideals and visions are misguided. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Nez, for coming to Factual America. It's been a pleasure having you. Um, you're one of the, you have the uh, privilege of being one of the first guests, and we look forward to having you again uh, in the not-too-distant future, uh, especially when we get to maybe podcast number 100 or so. Um, to our listeners out there, um, Please uh, tell your friends and family about us. Uh, get on the uh, Apple Podcast and uh, like us and share. And uh, don't also forget that uh, Naz has her own podcast, the, the Gender Knot, which is well worth listening to. And um, give her a like and a share. So uh, until next time, this is uh, Factual America signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guest, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, festivals we're attending, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.